you uh, all of you for very nice presentations. Um, in, rega in regards to this digital twin thing, which is kind of new to me, uh, I'm a physiologist, um, so I don't work in this AI thing. Um, so does when I see these pictures, it's it's very impressive. But does the the model takes into account uh, body weight, but also the density of types of tissue. Uh, and when you think of, for example, BMI, an athlete can have a high BMI, and BMI on a broad scale for uh, the general public is a good measure of maybe you're overweight. But for an athlete, your BMI might be 28, and you might be super healthy, and you might be super lean because you have a lot of muscle. So does these digital twins take into account basically the density of weight and weight in general when you want to use it to optimize performance? It's a great Thank question. You. I think probably, who wants to answer it? Look, sounds like a Karen question, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, and I'll start and maybe, Scott, you can uh, chime in. So when we do, it, it, so the, the short answer is that you make an assumption and um, and then and you your when you gen, when you uh, produce the results, you have to take into account that assumption. So, for example, you can assume that um, you know mass distribution um, is constant for each limb, right? And then that, that when you have the results, then that is the concept, that that is the, you know assumption that you have to take into account. But you could also have more. Uh, 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 you know, uh, elaborated models. If you you know that you have some assumption about the, dens the, 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 the density distribution of a different body parts, and you can definitely take into account in your model. So the, I guess the short answer is that it's a model. You can design uh, however many variables you want to put in there, but you have to have a way to be able to identify those the, the values of the variables. Sure. Um. I, I think it depends on the type of digital athlete you're making. For, the, for what I showed from video, we're just assuming some generic properties of, of people's limb segments. But what's really cool about some of the simulations that Karen showed where you can optimize performance for sprinting or for distance running, you can look at the trade-offs of maybe if I add um, strength to my lower limb, well, I'm going to have more power when I'm running, but it's going to cost more energy to swing my limb. So you can use these simulations to, to look at the balance between density and strength and all of that and, and optimize that using these, these digital twins. Connie Chu from Stanford Orthopedics and Swartz Medicine. Thanks to everybody for truly phenomenal talks. So my patients are always asking me, how should I train? How should I eat? Uh, what should I do? And so I'm particularly struck, Mike, by uh, your presentation uh, on the response to a banana or a cookie. And uh, just wondering, do you have a sense of how many different uh, subtypes? Um, I, I've heard you said twice in, in your presentation that everybody's different. Uh, and so uh, are we needing to personalize um, everything, everything that we recommend to patients? Mm -hmm. In my opinion, yes, at some level. <laughs> I think it's pretty safe to say you probably shouldn't eat cookies, and I can also safely say you shouldn't eat cornflakes and milk. That spikes most people. So um, there, but I do think what causes inflammation and doesn't, I, I do think we'll get predictive on that, but we're not right now. So right now it's a measurement science, meaning you, you drink your insurance to shake and see if it's pro or anti-inflammatory to you. But I hope in the future we will get predictive from your genomics and something called your epigenomics uh, and your microbiome, get predictive on this stuff. Right now we're not there. Um, but I do think people are reacting very differently um, in how, again, they're um, certainly from the dietary side, but also from their physical activity side. You'll see people's responses are really quite different depending how they run. And I think the nice thing about where we are now is we're in a world where we can measure this. I mentioned glucose measurements, but pretty soon there'll be continuous lactate monitors and continuous cortisol monitors and continuous ketone monitors. So I actually follow all this, and a lot of this is directly relevant to athletes, of course. Yes, yes. Thank and you. Uh, So maybe... Yeah, go ahead. Maybe. 
Uh, Kim O'Brien with Female Athlete Program at Boston Children's Hospital. Yeah. I'm actually curious about the vision intervention. I'm curious what specific components went into it and if it if there's a problem for some, if you may be controlled for people with poor eyesight than others, and if there's, if there are ever some limitations to the intervention for some of those athletes. Yeah. Um, so the way we oftentimes think about it is, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, you you want to correct the hardware first and then the software second. So think about the hardware is the nervous system that transduces light into the nervous signal. And the software is everything that happens in your brain, right? So in, in a best case scenario, we're taking care of the second part of your question first. We're, we're trying to make sure the hardware is as good as it can be. And you know, frankly speaking, our athletes don't do a good job of getting routine eye care. I mean, that's like one of the easiest knobs to turn, but we oftentimes outsource that. In almost all the colleges, I was at Duke for many years and people would come in you know, NBA caliber players and we'd be shocked at how bad their eyes are. So, you know, there's some simple things like routine eye care, um, but fix the hardware first and then the hard and then the software. So the, the cognitive training, the, the vision elements. Um, the second part of your question, or the first part of your question, the second part of the answer is, you know, what goes into a good vision training program? Um, in this case, we were tailoring it really towards hitting baseballs. That was, that was this, uh, this challenge. So we embedded a lot of different training that was focused on dynamic vision. So you think of, you, know, you go to the eye doctor and they measure your static acuity, right? What happens in sports that's static? Almost nothing. Either you're moving or the ball's moving, and it's usually really <laughs> dynamic. So in our hands, we're really focusing on training those elements of dynamic vision and your ability to resolve under you know movement and duress and speed and time limited conditions. Yeah, hi, Tor Bazier, Auckland Bioengineering Institute. Actually, Greg, I just wanted to ask you a question as well about the the visual cues. So, uh, work that was done in the 1990s with cricket fast bowlers, kind of similar to baseball, receiving a very hard ball at very high speed. Uh, nicely showed that actually athletes picking up on the, the visual cues of the bowler before the ball is actually even released. So my question is, are, are you also looking at visual cues of the athlete uh, who's delivering the ball, in, in this case maybe the baseball pitcher? Yeah, so uh, I think of vision as a prospective sense. You're trying to predict the future. You think of it in an evolutionary sense. The Frog doesn't care where the fly is now, he cares where the fly is going to be when his tongue tries to get it, right? So you're trying to predict the future with vision. It's, you know, it's a time machine, it's kind of cool. Um, so we, we refer to this as advanced cues, right? You're trying to pick up on the earliest, most advanced cues. So how do you do that? Well, some of it is your ability to resolve vision, to have that good dynamic acuity. But some of it is also expertise, that software of knowing where to look and knowing what cues are most predictive of the future. So that uh, VR example I gave at the very end is really targeting that. These types of approaches that are occlusion training or you know, trying to force the person to make the decision as early as possible or pick up those advanced cues as early as possible. And you know, we, th we, th we talk about that in cricket, bowling, and baseball, and softball. When a pitcher is telling their pitches, right, they're, they're letting on what they're going to do, you know, a good batter is doing that. They're, they're being able to pick that up. So I think how do we access exactly when they're doing it? Um, there's different ways we do that psychologically um, with a, a get other types of occlusion paradigms. But that's it's kind of the magic is the ability to predict the future as, as well as possible from vision. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm sorry, I would like to probably close the questions here. You're welcome to come up here. We have the people um, sitting on the stage. Maybe you come and we do this here and um, thank the speakers once again so that everybody can grab a coffee.